Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is the third episode of the series. Uh, we've titled it um, uh, MacArthur, Piper, and Washer versus um, John, Peter, and Paul. So that's the title of the series. Uh, if you didn't see the first two episodes, I uh, recommend that you go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, and part, watch part one and two. The first part was titled Probation versus Salvation, and the second part, the second video was titled uh, James Exposed. Um, well, so before we get started, I want to ask the panelists to introduce themselves to the audience. Uh, tell them the name of your YouTube channel, uh, we'll, and we'll start with Brother Austin. Hey guys, uh, my name is Austin. I run an online ministry called Christ Ministries. We do an online Christian evangelical group. Uh, we do soul winning on, uh, on the internet here. If you guys are interested, shoot me a message and we can do it. Okay. Thank you. And Brother Joseph. You caught me in the middle of my coffee pouring. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking you were going to go down the line. Eric should be next. Uh, I just want to say hello. My uh, channel is Jay Byron. Uh, I also want to note that while cameras often add uh, 20 pounds to uh, your weight, uh, my microphone seems to take away 20 points from my IQ, so ignore anything I may think is stupid. <laughs> yeah, but brother, when we take 20 points off of your IQ, the net IQ is still higher than everybody else. <laughs> I got you fooled. That's great. <laughs> okay. And brother Eric. Uh, let's see. My uh, my YouTube uh, channel is uh, Jesus Knight seventy two. It's uh, Knight K N I G H T. Um, new to the uh, to the group, and um, uh, I'm just gonna ride this out and see how it goes. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. And Sister Tanya. Hello. My name is Galaxy Dreams three on YouTube. My channel is just me vlogging about my Christian walk, things I learn, things I think you should know, uh, things I like to discuss, whatever. Um, I try to encourage and edify the body as much as possible. And Brother Luke Rob. Okay, very good. Okay, um, let me give you a little brief recap of the last episode. Um, the We have been taking on uh, various verses that people send us uh, because they say this verse seems to say you gotta somehow do some work to, to get saved and you know we believe you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone but this verse seems to say there's works that are needed so we're attempting to answer all those verses and explain them so that uh, people are not confused and misled by them uh, and we last episode we, we the first episode we started talking about some of the verses in the book of James and we gave our answers and then this last episode I decided to take a different approach and what I wanted to do was basically uh, expose or, or debunk the book of James as a whole and I thought I felt that that was the best approach uh, instead of taking on each one of James works verses uh, one at a time to let's just let's just uh, explain the book of James uh, as a whole, the, the problem with the book. And that's what we did in the last episode. And let me see, I've, since uh, we made the video, I changed the title and put in a little closing statement. So let me see if I can find that and read it. Okay, uh, the, I changed the title to uh, James Exposed. And I said, let's compare the doctrines of James and Paul. James says in James 2.25, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Paul says in Romans 3.28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So we can see in these two verses, these two are saying the exact opposite. James is contradicting Paul or Paul is contradicting James. They are opposite in their theology here. And the conclusion that I made through working through uh, all the verses uh, to point out who James was and who these uh, his followers were and what the book of James is really all about, I said the conclusion is James was a Jew who would not give up Judaism 
Paul wrote about and condemned James and his followers. They were the Judaizers Paul referred to in Galatians. Okay, so that's how we ended. That's how we did the last show, and we've. Um, so we now we're going to move on. But uh, before we do, I'm going to ask anybody to make any. Now that they've had some time to reflect on this, uh, if you have anything else you want to say about that topic as a whole, very briefly, and then we'll move on to other other verses. And uh, I'm not going to call on people. Whoever talks first gets to speak first. I saw. I saw. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead I was just real quick. Um, one of the things that I caught in the um, when I was listening to the video, did I hear you say that James was actually the first person who was told to preach to the Gentiles, or Peter, or something? Peter was. Peter was. Yeah, yeah. Peter was really the first apostle to the Gentiles, not Paul. Peter preached to Cornelius and his family and friends, and they got converted. They were the first Gentile believers, and and, and that happened long before Paul even was converted. Did it happen after Pentecost? Uh, yeah, it happened after Pentecost. That you can find that in my notes on that video. Okay. But that is particularly that happens in Acts 10, Excellent. and then in Acts 11, that's when uh, um, uh, Paul uh, re re explains the whole thing, or Peter re explains the whole thing in Jerusalem. What happened with these Gentiles and how they became saved? Because James and his followers are trying to impose Judaism on these Gentiles. So yeah, you really, uh, I, I, I've said it before, but uh, if you didn't see that video, I think this is really, I think it's revolutionary. Yeah, and I'm idea, definitely going to watch it. it it's, I've never heard anybody else say it until I got into long talks with Brother Mitch about all this. And years ago, uh, when we started talking about it, he kept on saying, his problem with James is that James is clearly contradicting Paul. And I always try to answer him by saying, well, they seem like contradictions, but there's ways of explaining it. Uh, but you know what? Every time I tried to explain it, I knew I was kind of twisting like a pretzel. And I, as, as, uh, as Brother Mitch said, you're trying to squid a, fit a square peg in a round hole. Okay? So uh, after a, a many talks with, with Brother Mitch over a couple of years, um, we, we, I think we, we've come to this conclusion that we expressed in this last teaching, and that is that uh, the, the Paul was in the book of Galatians and also in Hebrews talking about the Jews who became believers but would not leave Judaism. They're trying to keep Judaism mixed in, and that's these are the people that Paul was condemning, and I, I believe that it was James and his followers that, that Paul was talking about. So it should be no surprise if that's the case that that's the kind of book James would write. He, he wants people to be Jews and believe in Christ. And Paul said, you can't have it both ways. You're going to have to choose. You either become a Christian or you just be a Jew. You can't mix them together. Yeah, and if that's true, then that makes everything that Paul said makes more sense too because it explains why he was talking about that so much. So. Yeah, hmm. it's a, and it's a relief to know who Paul was talking about. I think that if you go through that, and I, I show you verse by verse how this all thing progressively happened, if you go back and watch the video and, and read the verses that I put in the description of that video, you'll see there's a, a, a chronological record of all these events, and James and his followers were those people. Okay? Uh, all right, so who, anybody else want to say anything about that before we move on? Yeah, I, I'd like to make one note, uh, Luke. I, I, upon uh, reviewing that uh, session we had, I note, noted that you did say this, but I, you gave me too much credit. I was too stupid to know, uh, too ignorant. Uh, James was not an apostle. Uh, Mitch made the point that uh, in another video, James was the brother of Christ, not James the apostle of Christ. And I, right. think, I think that does, uh, in my mind, make a difference. So uh, I think the apostles had a, had a special calling and inspiration inspired uh, uh, relation of the gospel, but uh, yeah. James the brother was not an apostle. Yeah, you know in the original 12 apostles you have two pairs of brothers. You had Peter and Andrew and James and John were brothers. 
So James the Apostle, who is the brother of John, is not the, the one that wrote the book of James. Yeah. yeah. Right. That was an assumption you made, but you didn't make that clear, because I, or at least I didn't catch it. And uh, Mitch had. I, I just assumed. I'm sorry, brother. I just assumed everybody knew that. <laughs> You'd be surprised at what I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And anybody else want to say something before we start going through these other uh, confusing verses? Real quick, uh, Brother Luke, is that why the Catholics choose Peter as their, uh, as they say, the I build my church on this rock because he was the first apostle to speak to the Gentiles? No. Uh, the reason they choose Peter is because uh, in uh, Luke 9.20, when Jesus asked uh, the, his apostles, he says, who do you say that I am? Who, who are all the people saying about me? And they say, well, some say you're this prophet. Some say that you're John the Baptist. And then J Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? Peter is the one that spoke up and said, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and that's when Jesus said to him, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Simon, you know, now you're Peter. Uh, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. So the Roman Catholics believe that uh, uh, Jesus is saying that on Peter. Peter will be the foundation of the church, being basically right. the first pope. But if you really understand what the Greek word uh, on rock, uh, Jesus is talking about on the rock he's going to build his church being the principle that Peter espoused, not not the, uh, the person of Peter. Uh, so the principle that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's the principle that Jesus would build his church. Okay, understood. You carry on, bro. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, okay, now we'll move on. But because I think, at least to my satisfaction, uh, I've uh, uh, we've done two things with James now. In the first session, we specifically talked to about three or four problem verses in James, and there were more. But then after, in the second session, I decided, well, let's just let's just answer them all by just saying. Uh, the book of James is the problem, not each particular verse. So that's what we did last time. So I see no reason to go back into the, any other verses from James. Uh, if everybody wants to, we can do that later. But for now, let's look at any verses that people send us that they say, well, if it's faith alone, how do you explain this verse? And who wants to bring up the first verse? I can go with, uh, I'll, I'll just start off. I'll do the Hebrews 10.26. Okay, you want to read it, and, and, and Tanya will post it if you find it, and, and uh, then we'll all discuss it. Okay. Uh, it says, and this, is, uh, this deals with a matter of fact of, is it okay to use it if it's uh, relaying that you can lose your salvation? Is that okay if I post No, this? no. Uh, working to get saved... And then losing your salvation, these are two different topics within this one subject we're on. Okay, any, so verse, we're on any verses that apply to lo possibly losing your salvation, I want to save to later. Okay, so we'll have to, I'll have to say that one because that, that deals with that. Okay. Okay, who, Tanya, you have some verses? Actually, no. Okay, I, I'm didn't, going to, I didn't get a chance. Go I'm, ahead. Going to, I'm going to just off the top of my head give you some verses. Okay, and uh, and then I want anybody. This is I'm giving you a group of verses because uh, it, this I would call a category. Okay, it's not just one particular verse; they all fit into the same category. Um, J Jesus said, uh, "Go and sin no more." Uh, J Jesus said, "Go and be perfect, just as my Father in heaven is perfect." Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything you own, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Jesus said, cut off your right hand if it causes you to sin. Jesus said, cut off your, gouge out your eye if it causes you to sin. Okay? These are all a category of verses, and I have an answer in mind, but before I do, I'd like you guys to discuss those verses individually or maybe you can see they're similar in, in a way and if you can identify how they're similar let me know I'll I got take one. the um, oh go, go ahead. ahead Austin I'll go after I, you I was gonna make a connection with uh, be perfect as your uh, father in heaven is perfect that can be connected to uh, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees 
Uh, I relate to those two verses alone as the only person that could fulfill those verses would be God himself, uh, Jesus Christ. And what he was referencing was that it's uh, a beautiful verse is how we should only rely on him for our salvation because he's the only one that even qualifies for the things that he states. The only person that could exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees was God himself because he was perfect. And be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The only person that could do that again was Jesus because he did. And he is God, as, as, we, as we all know, in the flesh. So we are looking at to Jesus 100% because he's the only person that qualifies for both those conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very good point. So basically, let me kind of sum up what you're saying. Is you're saying in these verses, Jesus is the only one who could do those things. Absolutely. Okay. How about anybody else? Who wants to comment next on those? I do. Um, on the scripture, he was just talking about uh, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. I've looked into that one myself because that one used to uh, trouble me. And when I went back and read it in context, it's Matthew chapter 5, read verse 43 through 48. What it's talking about specifically is loving your neighbor and not hating your enemy, which is, you know, obviously uh, shows and displays a perfect kind of love, which we know God is love and God is perfect. So when it tells us to be perfect like God is perfect, he's referring to that, loving your enemy. So that's that satisfied me with that verse. And then also the one you brought up about go and sin no more, that one didn't really make sense to me until I had kids. Because it's kind of like, uh, just because God or Jesus is telling the woman not to go sin no more doesn't mean he's saying, don't go sin no more, and if you do, I'm going to put you in hell forever. Oh. You know, he didn't say that. Like, we have to be careful not to, you know, inject what we think he's saying and actually read what he's saying. For example, I, when my kids do something wrong, I tell them, I correct them, and then I say, now go be good. Now, am I saying, go be good forever, because if you don't, I'm going to kill you? No. I'm telling them to go be good. Um, you know what I'm saying? So that's all. Okay. Absolutely. Let me ask you then. Let me ask you, based upon that last statement you just met, made, uh, uh, do I understand you correctly? He's not saying, uh, go and be perfect in order to be saved. He's saying, go and be perfect because that's what is good for you and that's what he desires from you. And that's what God does, and we should try to be like God by loving our enemy. Yes. Okay, so these are these you consider it more rather than a command, you consider it an exhortation. Absolutely, because if it, it, I don't think that God would command us to do something that, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. Never mind. I think you should say it, but you missed your chance because uh, <laughs> now we're going to move on. You should have said it. There's okay, a, who's next? Uh, there was one that I'd like to engage, the one you mentioned about, and I have fun with this one. Is the one where uh, you said, uh, if, if you're right, I offend thee, uh, pluck it out and cast it away. Uh, if, you're, if your hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it away. To insinuate that Jesus would actually expect you to do that um, would insinuate he would want you to self-mutilate, and clearly Jesus would not want you to do those things. So I think you have to look at what he's saying and – consider what he's saying. This is where the parts in the Bible where he says, you know, he, he who has an ear, let him hear. Think about this. Don't just take it at face value. Think about what I'm saying. So if you compare it to other things Jesus has said, well, let's, let's think about that. Does your right eye cause you to sin? No, it doesn't. Does your right hand cause you to sin? No, it doesn't. Um, you could, you would, you would hope that a person would get to a point after they've cut off both their hands and cut off both their feet and plucked out both their eyes that they realize they were still thinking sinful thoughts. That you can't be rid of sin in such a fashion. Um, it, it, I, I think it was more him trying to engage people who and we deal with this a lot in our age, which is who want to tend to make excuses for those types of things and want to tend to say, "What's well, not my fault? It's my eyes' fault. It's not my fault. It's my hand that caused me to do these things." Or they want to blame it on something else. Jesus tells us where evil truly comes from. It comes from the heart. It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man. Uh, it's what comes out of him. It's out of the heart all these things happen. They start there, and then we act upon them. We entertain thoughts we shouldn't have. Hmm. Can I add something? 
can I, can I say something, Eric? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Joseph first, and then Tanya. I, I, I think that uh, you could have told me this a little bit earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. That's me, a day late and a dollar short. Uh, okay, Tanya. Oh, that was good. Oh, man. Okay, so I just thought of something. Oh, my gosh. Let me see if I can remember what I just was thinking. <laughs> um, okay, so Jesus would not tell us to cut off our limbs. That is true. But G every, every word that Jesus spoke was the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. So he said it, but you know what? Like, if since God can't have sin around him or whatever, then God would do something like that if it was possible. If God panned with sinning, he would cut it off because he can't have it around him. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. <laughs> okay. I do have an excellent verse to go with uh, what we're talking about here to relates to Eric and just in general. It's about uh, the interpretation of scriptures. I, I like to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9 for it. And it says, but as it is written, the eye hath not seen, nor the ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Meaning we shouldn't take it at face value, everything that's said, because if we did, it would be pretty choppy. It'd be a pretty, it'd be a nightmare. But uh, these people, they like to preach to take it at face value, everything that uh, that he said, and that hurts a lot of believers critically because it uh, it hurts them in areas where God's trying to make you think about it more. Uh, the Word of God has that. It for all of us, we we look at it and then we grow and reading it again and understanding it again and then going back and seeing things we missed. But if we take it at face value then there's no room for improvement. Yeah, it's just, you know, we read it that, and then, oh, it must be this, but there's nothing I can do about it. So uh, I like to strive to say that there's a lot of places in the Word where even though it's a direct statement, it shouldn't necessarily be considered as that we should look at that. E uh, the biggest one are probably the parables, because most people look at the parables even as a, a very confusing thing, and we have to understand that it's a it's a masterpiece of how he worded it, but it's not to be meant to be taken completely as it is because it wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but I just want to put that out there because it, it fits with what we're saying. Okay, look at here. See this and this. You guys have been talking and made some good points. I made some notes so I wouldn't forget what I wanted to answer. <laughs> Uh, first of all, let's, let's take the term that uh, Brother Austin just said. He said, taking it at face value. Okay, um, uh, That fits into the category of what we call hyperbole. Uh, was, was, are we to take it at face value when Jesus says, cut off your hand? Or are we to look at this as hyperbole, hyper, like exaggerating to a point just to dramatize it, to drive the point home? Almost like when Jesus said, verily, verily. I'm, in other words, I really want to emphasize this, okay? And then in answer to Brother Eric's uh, point about um, obviously your hand doesn't cause you to sin. Your eye doesn't cause you to sin. You said you talked about the heart, right? It's your heart. Well, the heart is a, an organ that pumps blood. When we think of heart, it really means your mind. It's your identity, okay? So your heart or your mind is what is really um, uh, at the, pro the problem. And the identity of who we are, and the, our identity is uh, lost, fallen uh, uh, mankind with sin nature. And that's who we are. And uh, therefore, instead of cutting off our hand or gouging our eye, what we would really have to do is take out our mind instead of cutting your eye, go deeper, and take your brain out and remove it, because that's where the sin originates. That's the only way you could really accomplish it. So uh, I think that these things could be hyperbole, but so far nobody has said the, the key word that I have in mind for this uh, family of verses uh, that uh, I, I, I mentioned um, four or five. Uh, I think Tanya was on the verge of saying it, but she didn't dare. So, Tanya, what were you thinking? I'm going to give you one last chance before I say it, and then... I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. 
God okay. would not command us to do something that we weren't capable of doing. Wait a second. What were what was the last part that we what? Do doing right? Look at us. Let me see if that list shows up here. Uh, what's that word right there next to my finger? Impossible. Impossible. Yeah. These verses to me have always meant uh, these are the impossible sayings of Jesus. And why would Jesus to tell us to do something that's impossible? Um, anybody want? I, I mean, right, go and be perfect. Now, everybody's all we've already mentioned the point that it's not. No one. I think someone else said you, we can't do that. We're not capable of doing it. And and then uh, now we we're using we're narrowing it down to hey, that's actually impossible. We can't do it. Why would he tell us to do something that's impossible? So, that's any cool. ideas? Why would he tell us to do something if it's impossible? That's the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, to get us to see that uh, the law is a taskmaster that we can't please. Well, I thought you were going to say the law is a schoolmaster instead of a taskmaster, because that really fits perfectly. See? When Paul said the law is a schoolmaster, that is exactly the same point. Instead of Jesus quoting Ten Commandments, well, he did do that. He did do that to the rich young ruler. And this, this is exactly where Jesus really explains the real meaning behind all these impossible sayings. The rich young ruler says, uh, good, uh, good master, uh, what, uh, what th good things must I do? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one's good but God. And then uh, instead of the young Rich man, man saying, acknowledge it. Well, that's right. You must be go your God then. He never acknowledged. He didn't get it. So that went right over his head. And then he went on and saying, well, I've done this. I, I, I followed. Jesus said, well, did you follow these commandments? And he said, yes, I've done all these commandments since I was young. And then, G of course, he didn't because no one's ever been able to follow them perfectly. And in James, <laughs> they got one thing right. He said, "He said, if, if you follow the entire law yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all." That's how strict the law is. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if so, Jesus asked him, "Did you follow these commandments?" He said, "Yes, since I was a kid, I followed them all." And of course, Jesus knew he didn't. So, what did Jesus tell him to do next? Go and sell everything you own, and then give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And the young man left, dejected, because he wasn't willing to do that. Now, did Jesus tell him to sell everything and, and give it to the poor because it is sinful and you can't go to heaven if you own a lot of property and you're rich? No. Why did he tell him to do it? He was telling him to do it because he couldn't even get past the first commandment. He had another God besides God, and that was his money. It was his wealth. He was he was he loved it more than being willing to give it up for the sake of God. He couldn't even get past the first commandment. Yeah. Okay. Exactly right. And so Jesus was asking him to do something in a way to prove. You think you've really followed all those commandments? Well, look, you're putting money above everything else, so uh, that proves that you really didn't follow the commandments the way you're you're acting. You're just one of these relig self-righteous religious people that you know we fight about fight with on YouTube all the time. And then here's the amazing thing: the rich young man is gone. What happens next? It, Jesus says, "Oh, it's it's so hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom." It's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. And then what did his apostle say? His apostle said, well, Lord, if that's the case, Who how is saved? it possible <laughs> for anyone to get saved? Who can be saved, right? And what was Jesus' answer? Through With man, it is impossible. God but with God, That's all right. things are possible. That's right. Okay? So here we have two things happening. Over and over again, Jesus is telling people to do something that's impossible. And then he tells us that 
how is it possible for man to get saved then? His, his, his apostles are coming to this conclusion. You're asking people to do things that's impossible. And he said, well, that's because it is impossible with man. If man tries to get saved based upon his own efforts, it's, it's impossible. But with God, it's possible. In other words, he wanted them to know you're lost if you try to do it on your own. You need an intervention from God. You need a supernatural intervention from God, and that's what God did. He came down from heaven. He became a man. He died for our sins because we couldn't do it. So he did it. He lived a perfect sinless life that we get credit for. Uh, all, the all the sins that we committed were charged to him. So because it was possible, Jesus intervened on our behalf. And that's what we all need to understand. And Jesus said, with man it is impossible. So, so to me, all of those verses that I cited are examples of what Paul says, the law is the schoolmaster to teach us that we're sinners and we need to be saved. All the impossible verses Jesus said, these are schoolmasters to teach us it's impossible. Cry out to Jesus to save you. The, the uh, average uh, work salvationist will look at that same verse and counter, and, and their counter will be, see, if you are truly saved, God will give you the power to keep his commandments. How do we do How could they come up with that? That, has, that does, to me, has no link to anything we've been discussing. Where, where do they derive that from? Well, uh, after talking to a, a friend of mine who is a, 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 a Christian perfectionist, they believe that you don't sin after you're saved, if you're truly saved, uh, Miss Sally, she would tell you, see, if once you accept the Lord, he will give you the power to keep the commandments. And that verse proves it because he's saying uh, oh. you can be perfect if you rely on God. Oh, okay. But the question they asked him is not, how could we be perfect? The question the apostles asked him, if, if that is the case, Lord, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And they would say that if he was truly willing to accept Christ, he would have went and sold all he had, followed him, and he would have been in God's will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I can see why they would say that, but it doesn't make sense based upon the whole context of everything, because... Uh, as, as I said, uh, Jesus told them it's impossible for... Uh, right. It so, contradicts the words of Christ. It contradicts what he says later, which is that yeah. it's impossible with man. Yeah, but, yeah. but at the time, Eric, at the time, I, I'm, I'm almost willing to wager that many of uh, uh, the Lord's disciples didn't see that yet. And they were thinking, just like they did when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds those of the Pharisees, uh, you cannot be saved. They're going, oh, man. Uh, not only do we need to give a tenth of our herbs, but we need to even be better than that. Right, and, right. and still to this day, there's a lot of people out there that hold that view. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're right, brother. Uh, they didn't understand it, but over time, they started to understand it. And uh, that's, to me, this statement by Jesus uh, really answers the, their question. Because they're beginning to wonder, well, all these things you're telling us, these, this is really you're asking too much. It's not possible. And he says, well, yeah, you're right. It is impossible. That's why you make it on to save you. I'm, I'm of the opinion. It says that, that uh, Jesus loved this man. That, that was included in the scripture. I mean, it was noteworthy that Jesus loved this rich young ruler. He saw him approaching and he said Christ loved him. Now, why would he not? Take, and I made a video on this some time ago. Why would the Lord not stop and explain this to him and say, listen, here's what you're not getting. Instead, he let him walk away unsaved, unregenerate, un well, uh, uh, ignorant sure, of the I'm truth. Sure, I'm sure that everybody can answer that question. Go ahead. Answer Brother Joseph. To get him to think. Okay. And well, I think I, he I knew think, it was going to be written in the Bible and used for other people to learn from. Okay. Well, okay. My, my, my take on it, maybe I'm oversimplifying it a, a bit, but my take on it is we are talking about the Lord here. The Lord knows who will accept him and who won't in advance. If he, if he, it doesn't mean he doesn't love those who choose not to, uh, because you know he he gave up his life while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Um, he knows though who will not turn. 
um, he is not going to, you know, force them. It is he is aware of who will not change their mind. Okay, that's a good that's a good answer, uh, Brother Austin. Don't you have something to say about that? Okay, uh, I'm going to tell you. Uh, I'm going to, Brother Joseph. Your question was why didn't why didn't the Lord tell him in, in, instead of just letting him go, stop him and clarify it? Well, my question. I'm going to rephrase the question for you. Uh, Sorry, Luke. I'm here. I apologize. I, I I I had to let my dogs out. I'm, I apologize. Okay. My question is, Brother Joseph, I'm going to rephrase your question. Uh, it, because the qu same question is asked in another way. Why did Jesus speak in parables? His apostles asked him, why do you speak like that? Why don't you just speak clearly? Why are you speaking in parables? Everybody's getting confused. They don't understand what you mean. Why are you doing it? So what did Jesus say the reason was? Uh, I, that's a stumper for me, Luke. I don't know. Well, he answered it. It's right there in the scriptures. I don't know what he said, though. <laughs> okay. Does anybody know? I forget. I forget. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I cannot remember what his response was. Don't recall, Brother Luke. If, 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 anybody, if anybody can find the scriptures, find it for me, because I'm just going to paraphrase it in my own words now, okay? Jesus said he spoke in parables so that they would not understand. He did not want everybody to understand. He yes, says if they uh, don't... Matthew, um, I'm sorry, Brother Luke, let me interrupt you. It's Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Okay, read the rest. And then uh, let me... I mean, I'm kind of searching for this on my uh, online Bible. <laughs> it's quicker for me. I'm sorry. You want me to do it? I got it. Yeah, okay, if you go got ahead. it, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Matthew 13, 10 through 17. That's what it says. I'll just start reading. Uh, this is verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Okay. For who, do you want me to keep going? Yeah. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah. Okay. Which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's hearts is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Wow. I don't yeah, well, that get was it. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. It what happened? Exactly I... with uh, what I just said earlier in the show, 1 Corinthians 2.9, the, the eyes, the ears, and the heart. There it is again right there. So and it was right. fulfilling a prophecy to too. I, I missed about 10 seconds. Uh, the, the scrambling froze for a second there. So uh, I was asking, uh, I don't know what I missed, but my, my question is, Jesus answered your question, Joseph, but that was KJV. It's very easy to get confused. Do you understand the answer now? Uh, if I said I don't get it, that would put me right in line with who he said, what he said. So I'm going to say I understand. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, so the reason he didn't tell the rich young ruler, as you asked, Joseph, and the reason he spoke in parables was because these people's heart was not right they had 
eyes but they couldn't see, they had ears but they couldn't hear because they were uh, not ready for it. They're, 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 they were not willing. So in order to understand it and for to, in order to get a straight answer from Jesus, he had to perceive that they uh, they had their heart right. Their heart how, right. How, how does that how does that relate to us today uh, in our witness loop? Well, it gets to this point here that, that I've always made, and that um, I believe a a precondition. People have always asked me, well, what does this person have to do? Uh, before they can be saved, they have to have all these preconditions. Um, I believe there is a precondition, but it's not something that we work for and try to get ourselves in a position so that now we're we're able. No, it's just something that happens in our life where a person uh, reaches a point in their life where they feel that they uh, need an answer and they need the Savior. They feel helpless and hopeless. When they finally feel that they uh, are in a situation where they can't work their way to heaven, they're a failure, it's, it's impossible for them to do all these things that it says in the scriptures, it's impossible, and they throw up their hands and they fall on their face like the, the man did uh, who was praying at the temple and he said, Lord, have God have mercy on me, a sinner. So when they reach that point, that's the, that's the condition of a person's heart that they need to understand, I can't do it. I need to be saved. I need the Savior. Right. And once that happens, when they understand that they have this need because they're, they're incapable on their own, it's impossible, that's when the light comes on and it, it all starts, then they can see these things clearly. But until then, the parables won't make any sense. Yeah, and I was basically going to say what you said. You said it better than I would have, but... Um, as far as how it's relevant to us today, we go through little things like that throughout our life, especially after we become a Christian, that help us get to know God better. Like, you know, um, what am I trying to say? It doesn't mean that we're, we're being saved or anything like that, but, you know, there are certain things that, you know, we think we're doing right, and then God kind of smacks us upside the head with that two by four of love and like, hey, no, do this. You know what I mean? And sure. so I think that's kind of like what we, was happening with Nicodemus and how it's relevant today. I think it happens to us all often, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the uh, parable in the uh, the guy, the Pharisee and the uh, uh, guy in the temple who were praying to God. And it says that one man cried out to God uh, that he was wretched and unworthy, and he was forgiven. And it says about the Pharisee that he prayed to himself. Has anyone ever noticed that in that verse? It, the, the, the Pharisee wasn't praying to God. It said he prayed to himself. Isn't that weird? As he was not looking for God. He was looking to his own righteousness. Yeah. Or people to hear him, you know. Yeah. I, I thought that uh, several weeks ago, uh, we are trying to figure out a new topic for these shows. And uh, I think Tanya came up with this idea. Let's talk about all these verses that are confusing everybody. And uh, so we decided to, to do this. And since then, everybody's had plenty of time to like compile their lists. And uh, I've had people PM me and, and uh, also do questions on some of my videos. And a couple of the questions I didn't wait till the show. I just said, I'm going to make a video on this, like the parable of the sower and on Matthew 7. So I made videos on those rather than waiting for us to discuss it. But many other of these questions people sent me, I've compiled a list. So I'm wondering, I mean, I have quite a few verses that I can bring up that people sent me, but does anybody else have a list of, of verses? Yes. Okay. And now have, these are the, now we only want to do the verses now that right, talk about working to get saved, not losing salvation. Because remember what I did in the first show, uh, Austin. Before we went on to these uh, uh, controversial verses, the first thing I did was lay a foundation for faith alone. Absolutely. Now before we go on to the verses that people say you could lose your salvation, I want to have a chance to lay a foundation for eternal security verses. Okay. okay. I haven't done that yet. So that's why I'm trying to keep these two things separate, okay? No problem. Okay. Uh, 
Well, uh, I'm gonna. It's uh, John MacArthur's favorite verse about working for salvation. But I just want to point out one thing real fast, to Brother Joseph. Uh, I spoke with Saint Sally before. Uh, I think she's very dangerous. She's uh, she's uh, she's a Christian extremist to the to the fullest, and she teaches some stuff that I've never even heard of. But I just, I just if if you converse with her, I'd just be cautioned. Uh, I I want to uh, mention Miss Sally. Is, yeah. uh, a very, very sweet woman. I love her. Uh, she is uh, one of the sweetest women that I know. Now, I'm not saying I agree with her doctrine, but I do want to make mention that I love her. She, uh, when my wife had her uh, heart attack, uh, she. I, I just want to say that I love her. She's she's mistaken in her uh, in her perceptions and doctrines, but I don't believe for one second that she's not saved. I, I think that she is a perfectionist, a Christian perfectionist who is totally screwed up in her doctrine, but she is a sweet woman. Okay, because I just want to put that out there. Well, well, uh, I agree. I love her to death. I, I've talked to her many times. I don't know why we get along, because you guys know how I am, and how I am with people who have that kind of doctrine, but her and I just always clicked, and she's always been real nice to me. She's Funny. I mean, I like her a lot, so I agree, Jay. But yes, yeah, she is wrong in, in some things, yes. I just didn't want anybody to understand the fact that you, you have to be sinless. I think she I gives you gives No, you're right, right, Austin. Don't you, sure, sure. you are, you sure, are sure. correct, Austin. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm just, just looking out. Uh, I'm not trying to badmouth her. She is a nice person. Uh, I'll just continue. Uh, Hebrews 2.14. This is John MacArthur's favorite... Uh, verse for salvation, and it's about working to achieve it. And it says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So what I did was I went through the verse, I looked for the key words, and then the key phrase at the end, I plugged it in, and uh, this is how what I came up with to explain it. I, this one I have to use... More than uh, three verses to explain this one. It, uh, the first key word is follow peace. Uh, again, who is peace but Jesus? John 14, 27. Peace I leave unto you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we know that Christ is the peace. So when it says follow peace with all men, it could be a reference to following Jesus or act in a manner like Jesus to all men. And holiness, that's the second key word. Uh, for holiness, I came up with 1 Thessalonians 3.13, and it says, To the end he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God. So this again is a reference to Jesus saying, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Now, why could he do this? Because Jesus was perfect, and he is holy. And the only thing to make us unblameable in the sight of God is Jesus Christ's holiness. And it says, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So again, follow peace with all men and holiness. Again, two references to Jesus. And then this last part says, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, I looked up a different, uh, different places where it says, See the Lord, and I came up with a few. Uh, I went to a few Old Testament and a few New Testament. Uh, one of them for the Old was 2 Corinthians 5.7, and it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's a key, first key reference to seeing the Lord, and another reference to saying the Lord isn't dwelt with uh, the flesh, something that we can physically see. He dwells in the Spirit. He is the Spirit. Another reason we can't see the Lord is because there is a, uh, a holy relation between man and God, and when we broke that, God is perfect, and that's why he's held at a higher degree than man, and that's why man can't dwell with, with God with our sinful condition. That's why we can't see him. But as God dwelt with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before the fall, it was a difference because they were united with holiness. When that when that fall came, they, there's a there's a separation, a separation, a, a division. So first of all, we walk by faith, not by sight. So we walk by God. We see God in faith, even though we can't see Him physically. Uh, another verse to this is Matthew five eight: "Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. Now, again, the only person who was pure was Jesus. Uh, second, uh, then I have two more verses. Second Corinthians 6.17 Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Again, a reference to uh, forsaking wickedness and achieving righteousness, because he's saying that he doesn't he doesn't associate with them. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. He's uh, he's held at a higher degree than what people uh, put him off as. They they hold him at. And then I have two more. I have uh, Isaiah thirty-eight eleven, and it says, uh, and it saith, I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold I shall behold man no more with the inhabitants of the world. As long as we're in the flesh, as long as we're alive, no man shall see God physically because of our sinful condition. And the last part to what I was trying to get at is follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. This last part is the whole phrase, no man shall see the Lord. As clearly we were taught in John 14, 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. No man shall see the Lord by himself. We need Jesus Christ entirely to go see the Almighty. And that, I just wanted to finish that up. But uh, don't be don't be discouraged with Hebrews 2, 14, with John MacArthur's perception. Uh, look at it at a different meaning. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so you presented the problem verse and you answered it. Uh, does anybody have any other answers for the, the, this uh, verse that says, without holiness you can't see God, without holiness? Yeah, that's a, that's a poser for me. I, it, you know, I know the answer and everything, but it does uh, could easily lead someone down the uh, works road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whenever I see verses that talk about holiness and being holy and being perfect, you know, now I know this, I, there was a time I didn't, but now I realize that um, that's only possible because we're saved because of Christ. Like, it's his holiness, it's his perfection, you know, it's all of that. Um, mm -hmm. So... Well, uh, I think you uh, you gave the answer uh, early on. It says, without holiness, no one will see God. And then you cite one verse that says, we our holiness comes because of our faith. That's, that's, the, that's how we get this holiness imputed to us. Uh, another thing we have to understand is holiness is not a matter of degrees. Uh, and good, the word good is also misused. I think I've talked about this before, but good does not mean relatively good. That's why Jesus said... Why do you call me good? Only God is good. See, good, good is, a, is really synonymous with perfect. Good doesn't mean, oh, you're on a scale of 1 to 10, you're, you're a 6 and a half or a 7, so that's pretty good. No, you have to be a 10.0, 100% pure, perfect to be good, and the same thing is true for holiness. So uh, if a person thinks that they're, they're, uh, they're required to have holiness, their own holiness, that means that they, they have to actually be perfect. And and, uh, and the, the Bible says over and over again, uh, no one is righteous, not even one. Uh, the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. So if a man is trying to present their righteousness to God and, and say, this is, this is good enough, isn't it? Uh, they're going to fall short because uh, that's why we need the Savior. We need Jesus Christ to impute his righteousness to us, his holiness. And that's the answer to that question, that uh, no man has holiness until we receive Jesus' holiness. So it's the holiness of Jesus Christ that we need. All right, I had that on my list, the holiness verse. Um, uh, we're ready for another one unless someone wants to talk more about that. Okay. Okay, I got one. Uh, go ahead. Um, this one has always really been hard for me. This is Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Didn't we talk about this in the first first one? Striving? and, and the, the striving is not working, uh, but it's striving to find the right way, then Jesus is the only way. 
I remember us going through this in great detail. Oh, yeah. Maybe did. you were you there, uh, uh, Tanya, or, or I was. <laughs> you were. Yeah, but I guess I, it's worth bringing up again because oh, I know okay. that's a biggie for a lot of people, and that suggests you know working for the salvation. So. Yes. Okay. So let's take it on again here for a moment. Uh, even though I think we probably covered this in the first video on this. Uh, uh, what does that mean then? Strive to enter at the straight gate. It, it's a, a par it's a parallel uh, verse or uh, one that goes well with uh, the road to, to finding God is is very narrow and few be that find it. Uh, people love to quote that verse towards work salvation. So uh, does the striving apply to uh, our good deeds and our works and our our our, per, our uh, holiness and stuff, or or does the striving uh, apply to something else besides that? Well, there's the rub, Luke. What? I, I'm sorry, let Brother Joseph continue. Uh, I just I just spout off all the time, Austin, without taking a turn. I was saying there's the rub. To uh, Brother Luke, uh, you know, so there are people out there that uh, say it's works, and then there are those that say it's. Well, spirit. we know, we know. That's why Tanya brought up the verse because people look at it that particular way. But does the striving mean uh, quit sinning, try to be perfect, or does the striving uh, really striving f for something else? What else could it possibly be? I'd like to point out in uh, John ten nine who the gate is. Uh, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So we know that uh, the whole reference to the, the narrow is the way. Again, we know Jesus is the way, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. Narrow is the way and, sh and small is the gate or whatever. It, uh, the gate, is, they're both references to Jesus and Jesus entirely. Okay, but the problem, the problem is this word strive. And that's why we need to understand. My question is, does the word strive mean repent of your sins, change your life, and all that? Or is the word strive to be taken for, to apply to something else? And if so, what? I know it's for something else. Uh, I, I, would, I would take it to... To mean, uh, and this is based on a little bit what Brother Joseph was talking about when you when it, when you match this with the other verses that talk about the gates, the narrow gate, and the wide gate. Um, I think the striving he's talking about here is to understand. It's an understanding. It's not to understand what you need to understand to accept the way to the gate. It's it, it's 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 not a works. It is, for instance, you talked about it earlier. You talked about how when the person is, and the word I like to wrap all that up in what you said was when a person is broken, they realize what they are. I am a sinner. I need a savior. Um, there And there is only one who can save me, and that's Jesus. I think perhaps, and I could be wrong, but I kind of take the striving. There's a striving to understand because this is, this is, again, after he's talking about um, stories, he's talking about, uh, you know, he's mentioning faith is like a grain of mustard seed, uh, is like leaven which a woman took and hidden three measures of meal. Again, he's, he's telling um, uh, semi-parables in these stories, and so I think he's saying the striving he means is to understand. Okay. okay. Tanya, could you post that verse, the strive verse, on this so I can read it? Aaron? Yes. Do you have another Aaron. 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 Because Aaron. Because I'm sorry? Joe was speaking. Speak. I, I was just going to spout off as if I were a work salvationist. If I were a work salvationist, I would respond to Eric by saying, you know, brother, it sounds to me like you're trying to avoid picking up your cross and following Christ. <laughs> you sound like a person who's definitely been down that road with some with several of these people, and I know exactly. I kind of knew that was coming, <laughs> but well, uh, we know we know that the reason Tanya brought up the verse, brother, is because we know that how they use that verse. They're trying to make strive mean. Do you better do your best, do all the good works, and hope it's enough. I'm saying, does strive apply to works, working real hard, or does it apply to something else? Brother Eric says it has something to do with understanding. Okay, it says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Okay, and Jesus is this gate. Okay, now uh, I don't know about you guys, but in my life, 
Um, I studied all kinds of other religions before I became a Christian. And I was striving to find this right gate. And I looked at Buddhism, and, and I looked at you know uh, New Age philosophy and stuff. And, uh, and and then I actually because I strived and I seeked and I wanted to, I sought. I was seeking. If you seek, you find. I strove. Is that a word? I strived. And I finally found this straight gate. It was the effort to learn the truth and understand that Jesus is the gate and we need him. That is what we're striving for, to find this gate, and the gate is Jesus. And many people all over the world are searching and searching, trying to find, and God, if they do seek, they'll, God will reveal himself to them. And when they, if they have ears to hear, they hear about Jesus, they're... If their heart's in the right condition, they'll say, "Thank you, Jesus. I need. I know I need a savior. You're my savior." And, and I think I think that speaks to the latter part of that same verse. He says, "I say unto you, uh, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able." He doesn't say, "For many I say unto you will work to enter in and shall not be able to." He says, "Many will seek." This ties in with seek the truth, and the truth will set you free. Well, you know, the beginning of, of getting towards salvation is seeking the truth. You have to be willing to accept some certain things about you that God tells you about you. That was one of the things that led me to, to my salvation was I had to accept things and, and believe him when he said, I am not this good person. I am not this good, you know, a, a thing. I am... I am at heart evil. I've got sin in my heart, you know. And the world wants to tell you. You'll hear it all the time. Where I think uh, essentially people are basically good at heart. No, they're not. They're bad at heart, and that's something you have to accept and understand, or else you really won't ever come to salvation. It's the it's the whole process of if I don't realize I have a problem, then I don't really need a savior. If I don't, I mean, it's the old saying, you know. Uh, one of Satan's best tricks is you know, to um, get the world to believe he doesn't exist. If Satan doesn't exist, there is no fall. You don't need a savior. So it, it gets you to accept some possibly very uncomfortable things about yourself. Yeah. Um, I, right. I'd like to add, if I can, real quick. Um, you know, when verses like this, I like to take it real slow, each little section, you know, and I read it. And so strive to enter into the, and it talks about seeking, many will seek. Well, because you don't just enter in. People are seeking to enter in. Seeking is doing something. I mean, you, you've got to seek, you know what I'm saying? And, but anyway, that probably made no sense. But I went on blueletterbible.org, because I love that site, and I typed in strive. It popped up the verse Luke 13, 24 that we're talking about. But it also popped up the rest of the verses that use that same word. It's Strong's G75, okay? And I just want to read a couple of these verses to you because I find it interesting. For example, and some of these could also be used as verses that the um, work salvationist would probably use. Uh, here's one. Um, Colossians 1.29 Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Okay, so that's one that has that same word. Another one is 1 Timothy 6.12 that says, fight, and that's the word. That's the, the strong word, uh, fight. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. And then just one more. This is 2 Timothy 4, 7. And the word fought here is the same word as strive used. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So I think clearly, by using this even, we can see that that word strive just means to... Um, actively like you know I don't know help me out <laughs> well there, there's a the verse also the word seek is uh, instrumental and it says many will seek and won't find but if you read another verse it says those who seek with all their heart will find and so there's a, a point that you have to come to uh, and I think that maybe 
goes back to the rich young ruler. He was not at the point of seeking with all his heart. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll go with another verse unless someone wants to talk more about uh, striving. Just one thing, uh, I like to look at synonyms of words. Uh, in a way, they're it's usually related, uh, as we as we saw a gate and a door. Jesus didn't say he's the gate, he said he's the door, but in a synonym, if you look at the definition, it's the same thing. Uh, strive is also a work. And I, I have a point, I have a point where I'm getting with the work. Uh, if, if God's saying to work, what's a work of God? But to believe upon him, son, who he sent in uh, John six twenty nine. So uh, that could also be to, uh, if it's saying work to enter in at the straight gate, well, it would be God saying to work, and then what is a work of God but to believe upon his son, who he sent? Right. Yep. Strive, strive means uh, make an effort. Uh, so make an effort, and that means, and, and seeking. I think it really clearly, to, to me, just talks about, if you make an effort to find out this truth, you seek it, then you'll find the gate. You'll find the right gate to go through, and this is Jesus Christ. Amen. Yep, but we like to make everything so complicated, Luke. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll go on to another verse. Uh, anybody want to throw one out? or I? Or... Yeah, I have one. Uh, okay. Philippians 2.12. And okay. this is dealing with... Uh, a work. Uh, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in the absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, the two key words in this is fear and trembling. Now, everybody says to fear God. Again, I looked up the definition and I found a synonym for it. And uh, to fear God is not necessarily to be scared. In a sense, they both could be the same, but in this sense, it wouldn't make any sense because if we if we said to be scared of God after He saved us, that wouldn't make any sense. So uh, a synonym for fear is respect. So work out your own salvation with if we plug in the word respect and trembling. Now trembling was tricky, but I got it down. Trembling uh, is like an examination. Uh, trembling is not necessarily to see. The, crystal clear this verse sounds you should be scared of God right here but it says if you have your salvation why would you need to be you know it says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling I, it makes more sense if it's respect and examining yourself and then I remember a verse that says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith or if you fail the test or sorry it was a test but it was like to examine if you're in Christ or if you fail the test meaning you're not it's just an, it's just an example of uh, we should reflect at ourselves and know what Jesus did and have respect for God for saving us uh, in the sense of uh, if we if if we were fearing God with uh, with fear and trembling it, it wouldn't make any sense because you're already saved what would you need to do that for it's an it's an example of respecting God for saving you and trembling is just an examination of our lives or our faith and helping others in the same uh, manner I don't agree <laughs> Can I explain? Okay, yeah. I just looked up the word, and fear there means fear. Like, it means dread, terror, fear. Mm -hmm. um, it's Strong's G5401. Um, also, was I, trembling, I mean, I you know, that verse, I really think it really, really means fear and trembling, as in, like, you know, freaking out. Um but you're right that because we don't have to worry about our salvation, then why does it say that? But, but I mean, we I have mean, to keep in mind that word really does mean that that kind of fear. I mean, it really does. So we got to deal with it. Yeah, I, I I don't mean to get stuck on this one point and not get to the other verses that Brother Luke has. But on this point, I just was in a uh, conversation with the work salvationist. And we were, uh, she was talking about Jude uh, 23. It says, Others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted with flesh. And here's the work salvationist verse that I was going to bring up later. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. Uh, 
that's a, a work salvationist uh, verse that I hear quite often. Well, we we can't do two at the same time, brother. So we got to finish on this one before we go into that one. I brought that one up simply because the fear uh, was brought up, and that is a pertinent part of that verse. All right, I have a question. Um, we all believe we're saved, and we all believe that we cannot not lose our salvation for any reason, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. All right. So let me ask you something. We're not afraid of losing our salvation, but are you afraid? Do you have any fear of anything? Of course. Yes. What is your what are what are you afraid of? Well, of, of your dying thing. No, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I mean, the thing I, I think the fear that they may be talking about there is the same type of fear where they say um, in the Old Testament, where it says the beginning of uh, of wisdom is the fear of God. Um, we I agree. we fear our father's authority. We, we it's not that we're afraid of him, but we fear his authority. We fear what he is capable of. I think what the verse in twelve is talking about there, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't think it means. Uh, work out getting saved with fear and trembling it, it, it means you're he's already talking to his, to the beloved he's already talking to believers so he's saying you're saved but work out your salvation your lives as a saved person with fear and trembling realize you're now under a scope that God is going to be watching you're his child now so when you once you accept that you become a child of God he is going to discipline you as a child of God he is going to expect more from you as a child of God um, just as I would uh, of my son. I always equate that relationship. Um, we, he, my son is not afraid of me, but he fears my authority. It's, it's, it's a healthy fear. It's a fear for a just reason, um, for just repercussions. Eric, I think you are on the right track here. And I want to ask another question before I um, elaborate more on what you just said. Um, does the word salvation always mean the same thing? Does the word saved always mean the same thing? Does the, does the word fire always mean the same thing? Uh, if, if we can agree that it doesn't always mean the same thing, then uh, I would take this verse that is not talking about salvation regarding our eternal state, our promise of eternal life. It's talking about what Brother Eric was alluding to. This is a... Um, uh, the fear of the the um, oh, discipline of God, fear of the reaping and law of reaping and sowing. Now, if I if I went out tonight after the study and went to the Las Vegas Strip and found myself a prostitute and was with her, um, there's all kinds of uh, things I should be fearing that will be consequences uh, from that. Uh, my, I, maybe I could lose my marriage. Maybe I would get a venereal disease. Uh, all kind. Maybe people would find out, and I'd be humiliated and lose respect. So these are all of the possible consequences if I go out and do that. And I should be afraid of those things. And it's I, I want to be saved from the consequences, not saved from hell. So to me. Working out your salvation is not about working out your your eternal life in heaven. It's working out your salvation from the rest of your life, the consequences of your choices. So I think that Eric was on the right track, and that's how I would add to what you said, Eric. Mm -hmm. I, I would simply interject that if you're in 80%, of the churches in America that uh, teach work salvation, uh, that you don't have that understanding clearly, and uh, if you're like me, you have a lot of things to uh, in your life that you don't want there, and so personal guilt can easily translate into spiritual fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and the, all we can do too is um, every verse. If I was alone. Uh, uh, and I was asked these questions, I'd have to give the best answer I have. As a group, we can all put our heads together and come up with various answers and maybe uh, combine our heads and, and come up with a really good answer. But that's all we can do. If, if a person is stuck in this work salvation and they don't want to listen, don't want to accept it, well, that's 
as Paul said, there's no blood on my hands. We gave them the answer, whether they think it's a satisfactory answer or not. And this is a, this is a, I know you're concerned, uh, Brother Joseph, uh, that, uh, well, a, a Lordship Salvationist would say this and this. Well, all, we can't be responsible for how they are going to accept the answer. All we can do is give them our answer. Um, but before we gave these answers, what did we do first? We spent several hours laying out the foundation through clear verses. Now, these verses here are fall under the other category. Remember I said in the very beginning, I said, do we want to get our doctrine from clear, simple verses that say what they say and require no interpretation? Like, uh, uh, we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Or are we going to, uh, that's clear, no one's going to explain it any other way, you know, and, and it's not subject to various interpretations. Or are we going to take our doctrine from verses where ten people are going to interpret it ten different ways? That's not the way to get your, your, uh, your doctrine. So that's why I felt it was important before we started talking about the confusing controversial verses to first show, look at all the clear verses. And then, and that's our foundation. So now, how do we answer all the, the uh, controversial verses? We give them an answer. Now, if they don't want to accept the answer, that's, uh, that's their problem, you know? Yeah. And can you I might say want to say more about, about that one before we go on? Yeah, real quick. Um, I'm, I was just looking over it again. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed. So right there, he's, Jesus is straight up saying, Obedience isn't even an issue here. I just think that's noteworthy because if this verse was talking about obedience, this is um, the Apostle Paul talking right, to the church. Right. Oh, of this is Paul. Oh, right. okay, my bad. But see what I'm saying? Like, if it was about obedience, then um, he said that you have always obeyed, and I I believe he's talking about faith. What wouldn't he be talking about faith? I think Paul's talking to the church at Philippi about the things that he taught them. And he said, you've always done what I've said. And it's okay. for your own good. It's for your own good. If you listen to what I said, but if you don't, then, you know, you're going to, you, you, I, I can't say, you can't be saved from the consequences of, of doing these wrong things. Yeah, I think right, Paul okay. And again, I think, and you're right, Tanya. I mean, I, what you're saying is absolutely right, and that's kind of what I was insinuating too. Is he's saying his beloved? These are his brothers and sisters. These are these are. There's no question. They're believers. They've obeyed in in that they have accepted Christ. Um, he's just simply he's about to leave them. He's and and Paul on a regular basis was having to revisit issues with the churches because he would leave. I would have hated to really be a guy in his shoes. And we kind of we kind of deal with that today. You know, you you want to be in 20 different places at once because you want to do uh, some good work for the Lord, and you want to help people, and you almost don't want to leave them because you're afraid that somebody's going to come in right behind you, and they're going to mess up something you've done. And that's exactly what Paul was going through. He would leave, and then something else would come in, and people were starting to believe other things. And so he's 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 simply kind of telling them, uh, as I'm leaving you, keep these things in mind. This is how you need to live. This is the things I want you to do. These are the things how obedient I want you to do. Uh, how be obedient I want you to be. You're, you're children of God. Act like it. Realize your father is going to discipline you, so you should have that fear. Um, but he's not speaking to any of them as if, and that's why I think the comment doesn't mean that about work out your your salvation. It's it's he's dealing with saved people. He's simply saying, um, work out your you live your lives, you know, as obedient children uh, who are already saved with fear and trembling, you know, from of your father his discipline. <clears throat> I've had some people say, well, this does not say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. And um, there's a difference between working for salvation and working working out means you're saved now. Work out of it, out of your salvation. Now I want you to do live like this way, live, live a way that's worthy to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of one who belongs to Jesus. Exactly. And he comes down to verse 15. He says that very. He says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. He's saying I want you to behave like like the children of God. Yeah. yeah. Guess, what, guess what Eric just did? He gave us more context. 
Doggone it, when you add context, that's a lot of times you find the answer right there. Okay, uh, let's take another one. Anybody have one in mind? I do. Nobody okay. else has anything. Um, I was going to bring up Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, where it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, uh, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then verse 23, And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Let me say first that I, I did an entire video about 15 minutes long on Matthew chapter 7. And, <clears throat> and so I have a real, there's a real complete answer there. Uh, so watch that video. Uh, but go ahead, anybody else who wants to make a answer that on that point? Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, it's just there's a numerous bunch of things in it. Uh, many will per, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? The key word there is works. Uh, and it's a sense of they were relying on their works. It looks like how they're doing it is they're describing their, their life and their deeds of why they should be let in because he's saying that, uh, that you know, they're there. They're trying to gain entrance. Uh, and then they're saying everything they've done. There are many wonderful works. Uh, already we know that Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For grace are you saved by faith, and not of yourselves, uh, not of works, or I'm sorry, for grace you saved by faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And right here, these guys are clearly boasting of all their many wonderful works. And it says, And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work inequity. The inequity is, their their works are inequity because they never trusted in Christ. And uh, then again, all our works are as filthy rags. Uh, book of Isaiah and uh, they never did the will of God, and we know that in John 6:40, the will is simply to believe on the Son whom He has uh, sent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, I, I've often said that the uh, uh, Amy Daly did a video titled uh, "Luke's Litmus Test." And uh, I guess you could call it a litmus test, but it's, it's to me I call it a diagnostic question. And uh, uh, I got this idea originally from uh, a course I took right after I got saved. I took a course in evangelism called uh, Evangelism Explosion by Dr. D. James Kennedy, uh, who's deceased now. But he, uh, he said, uh, before you uh, tell someone how to get saved, uh, you, you want to diagnose the con their condition. So he came up with com questions to ask them so you can try to determine if you think they're saved or not. And the diagnostic questions are not, do you go to church and uh, uh, have you repented of your sins and are you really doing this and doing that? And that's not the diagnostic question. The diagnostic question is, uh, if you die today, are you certain you're going to heaven? And if they say yes, then you say, on what grounds? On what grounds should you go to heaven? And uh, so that's that's the diagnostic question that I believe is the right thing to try to understand. We do not determine if someone is uh, saved based upon examining their lives. We, we, we examine them, like it says in the verse someone mentioned earlier, test yourself whether you be in the faith. So I'm testing them to try to... Oh, did he freeze for anybody else? Yeah, okay. <laughs> he froze up. <laughs> Darn. Okay, I'm going to say something while he's frozen. I have a suggestion, and I'm going to do this. Next to Matthew verse, uh, what was it there? Uh, 721, you know, the part, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in mm -hmm. heaven. Mm -hmm. I think we should write, just in our little margin, mm -hmm. John 640 and not the whole verse, but just make a note, John 640 and John 629, so that when that verse gets brought up, because it gets brought up You have the answer to the question, what yeah, is the you will have of the it right Father? there. What is mm -hmm. the will of the Father? The will of the Father is exactly. to believe in the one he has sent. That is the will, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you know what? 
What was, the, what was right the exact? I, I don't have it right here. Do you have the? What was the exact? Yep. Two verses you came up with. John six forty. That's the one addressing uh, what the will of. John six twenty addresses what is the work of God, what and is the that work is of God? so believing on Jesus. So right. right. Can you guys still hear me now? Yep, yep, you're good. There you are. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. I lost you for only about five or six seconds, though. Uh, and then I heard Tanya talking. So uh, I don't even remember why I made the point, what the question was now. <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah, I remember. It's because of Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7 is, is uh, not about bearing fruit. Bec uh, you know, you know them by their fruit. It's not talking about a believer, it's talking about a teacher. You'll know this false teacher by their fruit. The fruit is, are they getting people into, uh, saved or not? And, uh, and as you go on throughout the whole thing, it finally reaches this climax where it says, uh, and they're before Jesus, and they're pleading their case to Jesus, and they're pleading it based upon their own righteousness. Look what I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, that's not the what you need to do. You need to uh, just put, uh, plead the blood. Plead Jesus as my Savior. That's the answer. It's right. not pleading your case like, look what I did. Right. But There's another side. Add, to it. My question here is, who do we know who will, who would be in front of Jesus and saying, look at all the mighty works I did in your name. I did this and I did that and I did that. Mm -hmm. Who are those people? Well, they're going to be the people that we're talking about right here, the, the, some of the, the these Lordship Salvationists who are going to who are going to depend more on the works yeah. they've done. I can name some right them. now. We got, there's some famous ones. You got Ray Comfort. Mm -hmm. We got Paul Washer. Mm -hmm. We got John MacArthur. Mm -hmm. We got John Piper, yep. and we got all kinds of other lesser known people on YouTube yeah. that we know. Yeah. And these are the people that are being condemned. But the Lordship Salvationists they like to take that verse and use it for their purpose, saying, "Look." They didn't do enough works. Mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't say they didn't do enough works. It's mm -hmm. saying they're trying to just be justified by their works. That's right. They're trying mm -hmm. to justify themselves mm -hmm. in front That's of right. Christ by what they did. Mm -hmm. ne That's never once, a never red once. Flag. Yep, never once do they ever say. Um, but but Lord, uh, you did this for me. Uh, they don't say that at all. It's never once brought up. You know, it's, right. it's left completely out of the equation. And there's another side. You might as well lump them in with the people who will uh, invoke the name of Jesus, as in he's a master, he's a wonderful teacher, but they will not acknowledge him as God, and they will not. Um, oh, what's the other thing I wanted to mention in regards to that? Um, left me that's that that quickly. Mine like a steel trap, I tell you. Okay, well, I had a point to go. <laughs> can I piggyback on what you were saying real quick? Sure. And Please, might, feel free. <laughs> I was just going to point out that some people like to use that verse to point out a supposed contradiction, which is that, you know, I can't remember where it says this, but anybody who calls on Jesus' name will be saved. You know, mm -hmm. that verse, I think it's in Romans or something right. like that. Well, right. they would use that, and then they'd say, ah, but look, these people are calling on Jesus, or they're saying Lord, and they're not saved. He said he never knew them. But then let me point out this. Even the demons actually called Jesus Lord. So I don't. So clearly there's a difference between just calling him that title, just like mm -hmm. sir, or, mm -hmm. you know, like that, and actually... Um, well, well, there's okay, another side of that. Idea. There's another side of that too, and it's interesting you brought that up. The other side of that is, remember when he's saying this. Many will say to me in that day, and that day everybody will acknowledge him as Lord. Before that, they may not have. See, but in that I time, they that. they're saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Well, because everybody's going to acknowledge him as Lord. That there'll be no question. They'll stand before him as Lord. Um, <clears throat> but you did it's actually help me remember that uh, you every tongue help. will say it. Sorry, go exactly. We'll confess to me that I will confess to the Lord, Jesus Lord. Um, the other side of it is you get the other people who want to say, and, uh, and Brother Luke did a really good video about this, um, who want to attribute all these things to Christ and say all the wonderful things he, uh, that he does, but then say, but there are many ways to heaven. 
it's, so you you can invoke the name of Christ all you want, but the minute you add more to it, you're it's not the true salvation message. He, you're not you're not entering by the narrow gate. You're 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 entering by the wide gate again and saying, well, yeah, well, everything he did was wonderful, and Jesus was this wonderful guy, but but uh, there's lots of ways to get to heaven. And that's one of the big things you have going on right now is you can't – you try to tell somebody, oh, there are not many ways to heaven. Oh, you'll be raked over the coals for it. You'll be – I mean – Can I say one thing real quick? Mm -hmm. um, I want to bring up Joel Osteen. Don't – don't <laughs> you know, don't kill me. But you know oh, what? Go he right ahead. <laughs> he gets a bad rap, man. He really does. And I jumped on the let's hate Joel Osteen bandwagon. I did for a long time. But then I actually went and I read what he believes in and all of that, and I watched interviews with him because, you know, I'm being a little more careful about how I judge people like that. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think and, that's fair. I think it's fair. And you know, I, I, think, I think Joel's problem, and, I'm, and of course, look, look, as true believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we always have to leave the door open for a person to correct situations. So I think simply slamming the door and saying, I don't even want to hear you again. I mean, it doesn't help the narrative. It doesn't help the situation. So I agree. In, uh, somebody like Joel Olstein, I think the guy's just not good under fire. He, when, 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 he, when, he, <laughs> when he's put on the spot and he have to answer these questions. But the problem here is that this man claims to be a leader of a large group of people, a church leader, you have to be able to answer these questions, or then you become part of the problem. I mean, you, I agree. you, you quickly I become part does. of the problem. But the reason I brought him up is because he said something in an interview with Oprah, okay? And he said, or Oprah asked him, are there many ways to heaven? And, she, and he said, there is only one way to heaven, and that is Jesus Christ, but I believe there are many ways to Jesus. I agree with that. So that kind of just goes with what you were saying. And you're right. He is a little bit too soft for my taste. <laughs> but I do like the fact that he, um, you know, people call him like, oh, he's nothing but a motivational speaker. Yeah, he is. He's a motivational speaker. And, but he gets people to try to trust God. And, yeah, he's a little soft. Okay, whatever. But he's a Christian, and I don't care what anybody says. He is, and I like him. Mm -hmm. That's it. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. Did you, did you hear me? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. No. Because a, a, oh. a notice came up and said my microphone would be uh, muted by default because of no, so many people on the panel. So if you can hear me, <laughs> let me say this about Joel Osteen. Uh, for a long time, I didn't like Joel Osteen because his his it, in a, if he talks for an hour. Uh, uh, 59 minutes and 50 seconds are about success, and uh, and then then 10 seconds at the end is is uh, make Jesus your Lord and Savior. That's it. Yeah. So I didn't like him for years. Then I thought, well, maybe there's a place for people who are their ministry is being an encourager, and he's a wonderful encourager. He's help, trying to help people to have positive attitudes and be successful and so on. So I tried to make it acceptable in that way, thinking, okay, uh, that's his primary ministry. But, Tanya, what I saw him in an interview, I saw him in an interview with, with Larry King. I saw and Larry, too. Larry King asked him, uh, Joel Osteen the same question. And I saw this question asked to Joel Osteen and to Billy Graham and to others. And he always asks him that question. It's the standard question. He wants to make sure everybody has to answer this question, and that is, uh, is Jesus the only way to have way to be saved? Yep. Okay. And Billy Graham and Joel Osteen and everybody else except one person I'm going to name, they all said, well, I'm not going to say that. He's the only way for me, but I'm not going to say he's the only way for everybody. You know? What? Billy Graham? Yes. Billy Graham said yes. that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Billy Graham. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brother, Luke, Brother Luke, I want to interject here. I've got to stop you. Uh, Billy Graham did not say that. Billy Graham, I watched the interview too. What he said was, is that we are judged on the light given, and there may be some people who do not have much light, just a sliver. Uh, and if they are truly seeking God, then he'll count that as faith 
in accordance to the light they've been given. He didn't say that there's other ways. Well, no, that's to me, that's the same thing. That doesn't explain it away. That's that's yeah. your answer. Your answer there is no better than the answer he gave. I, I think it's dancing around the obvious answer. There's an obvious answer to the question. It's yes. That's the only answer to the question. To to do anything else is dancing around the the question, and it really does not imply it really doesn't imply that you, that you really know what you're talking about or that you really believe it and I understand what I understand what Joseph is saying and this is why we have to be so careful about what we say in front of people we, we have to be very aware of our words and everything we're using now he may have not meant anything well, negative here's what in I saying think he that. probably meant he probably was trying to address what about the people who've never heard of Jesus. That's right, Tanya. And the Bible does talk about that. It talks well, about how the law is written in their hearts or something like that. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? I think it's well, actually, yeah. And and I mean, if that's the case, then fine. And actually, Luke, I think did a, did a pretty good video on on that very issue because people will talk about you know when you mention well, we come into the world, we're we're born into the world in sin. I mean. That's how it, it yeah. will have. Well, then you're saying children go to hell when they die because they didn't have a chance to accept Jesus. No, absolutely not. Um, the blood of Christ, and I agree with Luke. The blood of Christ, the grace of God, falls on those those children who are not able to to make that decision for themselves. They they couldn't possibly make it, and that would be the answer I'd have to give because if a person were to put me on the spot like that and ask, and and maybe that's kind of what was happening with Billy Graham in the interview, was that you know they they want to put you on the spot and say you know. What about the person who's never heard of Jesus Christ? I'd have to say I'm not sure because I don't have a definitive I, – I, there's I don't have an answer for that. But I I believe that the grace of God would fall on those individuals as well. If you don't have the possibility, I'm sure God's going to handle it the right way. And when we see how he's going to handle it, we're going to be amazed at it. <laughs> I don't I have, have the answers. answers. Eric, if you were, Eric, if you were on Larry King, we'd be chastising you right now. <laughs> I think that, that this would actually be a very good topic to do a show on, is what about the people who've never heard of Jesus? It is a good topic. We, we need to know the answer to this, and I don't know it that well. And that's one of those questions that is asked a lot, and it's a valid question. A lot of the atheists like to ask that question. It is a good. It and is a valid question. It's a very valid. So I that would be a good show, Luke. Maybe sometime. Well, I, I can give you my answer right now. But uh, the uh, first of all, um, um, the Billy Graham and, and Joel Osteen and all the others who would not stand up for Jesus when Jesus said out of his own words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That's all you need to say. Just quote Jesus' words, and that's enough. Right, right. But they wouldn't do that. The only person that did that is someone else who a lot of people are criticizing, but at least he stood up for Jesus. And his, his name is Rick Warren. He's the only guy I've seen interviewed by uh, Larry King that actually said, this is what Jesus said, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah, and if I say one thing real quick, I just would say that, like, even the people that haven't heard of Jesus, the key here is even those people come to heaven through Jesus because he is the only way. So he really is the only way. It just, that's I'm the way tempted, it is. I'm tempted to go into this, but I'm afraid that we're going off on another ta tangent that probably <laughs> deserves a lot more time. Uh, I'd like to answer my question. Uh, Give you my answer on that, but uh, maybe it's a uh, better I'm cool with that. Bite, bite yeah. my tongue and, and wait until we have more time. Uh, I got time. All right, okay, I'll tell you. This is one of the reasons that I, after several years of defending eternal torment in hell, this is one of the year, reasons I concluded that I could no longer believe in eternal torment in hell. I mean, I have a video called "Eternal Death Versus uh, uh, e e no, Eternal Eternal Torment Versus Eternal Death." So I hope everybody will watch that, and then I have the text of it because I just read an article. I have the text. I'll send you the article so you can study it very carefully if you like. But after just as I talked with Brother Mitch for several years and heard him out and debated with him, and then I was won over on this question about the Book of James. I also have been persuaded by my best friend here in Las Vegas, Brother Tony, 
who fought with me as I defended eternal torment the way everybody else ha does. I defended it for years until I was finally persuaded. But this is, this is another reason that eternal torment does not make sense to me. Uh, you can take people who have never heard of Jesus. You can take people that, let's say, are young, uh, are too young to understand, or maybe retarded and not capable of understanding. And, and uh, people would say, well, they didn't believe in Jesus, so they're going to be burned forever in hell and tortured with, with a blowtorch forever and ever and ever. And um, not only do, do I, can I give you all kinds of scripture that, that refutes that, but it just it defies my idea of, of, of who God is, this love, God of love, mercy, justice. And so to me, the idea that a person is mortal, uh, in, in the video I'm recommending you watch, I, I use scripture to show, to prove, that we are not born with an immortal soul. This is a fallacy, and according to scriptures, we're born with a mortal soul. So people who think that we have an immortal soul, they think that since you're going to live forever, it's just a question of where will you spend eternity, in heaven or suffering in hell? That's not the question. The question is not where you're going to live forever. The question is, will you live forever? And not everybody will. We are immortal. And, and uh, the only way we get immortality, what Jesus said, uh, the Bible says, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can't get, we cannot, we do not have eternal life. As an unbeliever, I never had eternal life. I was not immortal. I wasn't going to live forever, and it was only a question of where. No, the question was, I'm going to die. Do I want to keep living and have eternal life? It, in order to re receive this eternal life as a gift, I need to put my faith in the Savior. So those of us who put our faith in Jesus, we're going to live forever and with joy, bliss, with Jesus, the angels, and the saints. Those people who never put their faith in Jesus are mortal. They're going to die. And when they die, they get resurrected, they go to the judgment, and at the, judge, at the great white throne judgment, they're, they're told, you should have put your faith in Jesus. You're mortal. You're going to die. So uh, you had a chance, but you didn't. So therefore, you're going to die. And they die, and they're cremated in the lake of fire. That's the second death. That's what the Bible talks about. Don't fear man who can only destroy your body. Fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And uh, so... That's it in a nutshell. So for that reason, I can say it's perfectly fair for all the people who never believed in Jesus or an innocent child or anybody else who's incapable that it, they're not going to be tormented and tortured forever and ever. They're going to die. Just as though if, if we were all atheists, everybody basically thinks, well, you, after you die, you're dead. And nobody thinks that much of that. Well, okay, they're just dead. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, it, that is what's going to happen to those people who never heard of Jesus. They, had the, they, could, they never uh, received eternal life. Uh, I'll tell you what, Luke. I, I never, ever plug my own videos, but I, I, I've watched yours several times. I, matter of fact, I've watched yours and taken notes as I've watched it. It's, it's an excellent video, and I'm not saying you're wrong. But I, this is, I, I will encourage people, if you get a chance and if you uh, have the time, I've got a 29 minutes, longest video I ever made, 29 vid minute video on hell. And uh, I couldn't disagree with you more, Brother Luke, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I do agree with Brother Graham uh, on, on this issue. Uh, I just wish, uh, if you have the time, to watch that one video. That's the only plug I'll ever make. But uh, I, I do believe that we are eternal, uh, our souls are. But... Uh, just my two cents. Right. What's uh, the name of it again? Uh, uh, hell 101 or something like that. I forget. Okay, okay, sure. What the hell? What the hell? Uh, the, in, the, in the video I made on this subject, uh, I did not write the essay. I, I, I normally speak my own words or quote scripture and expound upon it. In this particular video, uh, I read an essay written by someone else. Yeah. In, 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 the, in the essay, in the essay, this man presents both sides, so you can choose. Acorn, eternal, right? eternal torment or annihilationism. No, so that's both, both, both 
cases, I believe, are presented very fairly in this. So I'm not trying to tell everybody you have to agree with me on this. You know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to impose that on anybody. But I spent years defending eternal torment until I was convinced it was wrong. So uh, I believe the scriptures say that we do not have an immortal soul. There's plenty of verses. Excuse you're, me to say that. You're referring to Randy Acorn. And, uh, I, I, no, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm my mistake. Uh, but I, I, uh, I just would say there's another side to the coin. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess our, our time's almost up. So let's make some uh, – we still have a lot of verses that we uh, want to discuss that are controversial, confusing verses that people could think, well, maybe faith's not enough. Maybe works are also required. So uh, we're going to take on those verses in the coming episodes, and then maybe we will uh, take this on and go into more detail on this topic in a future study. Uh, but for now, uh, let's, let me ask each person to make any like uh, final remarks on this, and then we'll end the show, because I like to make them like, approximately two hours long. Okay, uh, who wants to go first? Oh, okay. I'll go. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, this was a great Bible study. I learned a lot. Love you guys. Um, looking forward to the next one, which will be Sunday, and I'll be able to come to this one because I'm not going out of town, so that'll be good. Um, I guess that's all. Okay, sister. Thank you. Okay. Brother Eric, Brother Eric? Um, uh, great, great study today. Uh, this this was really good. Um, everybody talked constantly. It was great. <laughs> um, now I think we I think we actually covered a lot of territory uh, tonight. And and like we talked about, these are interesting questions that are raised often, and they do need to be engaged. They they, they need to have. And I think your question earlier about you know, you said you used to do videos on these, and you just take you, you would normally take questions just answer a video based on it. I think in this environment, it's it's really good. It, it gets a few different. Uh, opinions uh, put in there, and like you said, we can we can agree to disagree. Uh, uh, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. It's no no big thing. I mean, you know, and who knows? You know, who knows how your mind may may change uh, over time. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I I think I've told everybody that uh, uh, to be uh, on the panel, uh, I I only ask two things: one, that we we share these basic core beliefs that Jesus is God, we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone, no work is required, and that, and that we can never lose our salvation for any reason. So everybody on the panel and anybody who will join the panel in the future uh, must uh, at least uh, adhere to these core beliefs. Now, the 97 other things in the Bible, uh, I welcome all kinds of opinions. I love to learn different things from different people. And guess what? Sometimes I'm persuaded. I, my mind changed about KJV onlyism. My mind changed about eternal torment. My mind changed about the Book of James. I'm opening to open to listen. And maybe someday somebody will actually listen to me, and they'll change their mind. <laughs> okay, brother Joseph. Well, as you know, I'm I'm a. Uh, uh never uh, slow to speak, which may be some uh, disadvantage sometimes, but I really enjoy these Bible studies. Uh, it's They're unpredictable. I love going down roads and enjoying the scenery and uh, not knowing what we're going to see before we get there. Uh, so uh, for me, it's been a great Bible study tonight, and I really appreciate the diversity of opinion, too. Thank you, brother. Brother Austin. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, God bless. It was a good study. Uh, can't wait for the next time. Okay. Brother, boy, you know, you, you were a chatterbox before these last two <laughs> studies, man. You just, you're, you're just so considerate. You're just kind of, uh, you're yielding and giving time to the other panelists because you're so fair-minded. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I just thought his microphone was broke. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, let me just say that uh, anybody who has, did not watch the first uh, video in this series. Please watch it because uh, we, we, I think we proved beyond any doubt that our salvation comes uh, by faith alone and Christ alone, not by any works and not by a combination of works and faith. So we proved that in the first episode. And then since then, and then in the second episode, we took a close look at the book of James, and I think that uh, through that we, uh, at least for 
to my uh, to my satisfaction, uh, the book of James has been refuted as uh, uh, we we shouldn't have to even worry about any scriptures in the book of James. They've been answered. Uh, now now we are taking on uh, in this today and in future episodes we'll be taking on any verses. If you have a, a problem verse that is making you have doubts about faith alone for salvation, send them to us, and we will one by one take them on and discuss them. I don't know if we'll ever we'll come up with an, an answer that will satisfy you, but we will do the best we can. Now, for anybody watching, uh, if you are not a Christian at this point, I'm going to tell you how to become a Christian. A Christian is simply any person who relies completely on Jesus Christ for their salvation. Um, to become a Christian, you don't have to join a religion or become a religious person or follow a set of religious rules. You simply need to trust the Savior. Don't put your faith in yourself. Put your faith in the Savior completely, and then he gives you eternal life as a free gift. If you do that, please make a comment, and uh, we'd love to hear about it and celebrate. Okay, so bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. By the way, panelists, uh, after I end the show, we'll just talk privately for a minute, okay? Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.